Thank you, Lord. Father, we are grateful. Grateful for life, grateful for peace, grateful for health, grateful for your strength that keeps us going, grateful for healings in our bodies, comfort in our hearts, grateful to see another day, grateful for all the things that are working in our lives, grateful for the ones not working yet because we know that you are never overwhelmed. Grateful for PCG, for the lives we've been able to touch by your grace. For the many lives we'll still touch. We are grateful. Thank you, Jesus. As we go into your word today, Lord, we receive open eyes. We receive understanding hearts. We receive grace to believe. We receive miracles in our lives in the name of Jesus. Let your word come alive to us. Let somebody find joy in your word again. Let someone find joy in their relationship with you again. And Lord, let this service turn somebody's life around forever. In the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, good morning, church. Um, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're watching this from. Um, it's so good. So, so good to have you uh, at PCG today, right? Uh, so you might be seeing something different in our production today. Um, it's a different logo we have in there. It's different from the PCG logo we've used since inception. Uh, we just thought it wise to um, transition to another logo now. Not because anything is wrong with the old one we used. As a matter of fact, it's, that's as simple and communicative as can be, but we decided to move on to this one now, and it's, um, again, a simple work of art. The yellow background there signifies youth, energy, hope, and joy, okay? And it's also a color um, synonymous with peace. And right in there, we have the dove, that beautiful dove, okay? It's an expression of purity and an expression of the Holy Spirit. Okay, and so we are a group of people that have peace in our hearts. We are young at heart. Okay, we are hopeful for the future. We are energetic. And in all of this, we have the peace of God in our hearts and we have the Holy Spirit to guide us. That's the whole idea of this new logo. It's very beautiful and um, you will be seeing it now instead of the old one. Uh, please get used to it. Okay, it's exciting for me and I'm sure it signifies a new face not just for PCG, but for everyone that identifies with us. All right? Just thought I'd chip that in. Okay? Um, so how was last week's sermon? We were teaching on Bathsheba, uh, woman like us, right? Um, during the Men Like Us series. Okay? Again, I'd like to um, explain uh, the idea behind the Men Like Us series uh, to everyone. We decided to uh, get people to throw in names of Bible characters that they wish to know more about. Okay, and we decided to, uh, you know, dig deeper into the lives of these Bible characters uh, just so that we can make clear to everyone that uh, the Bible is real, these characters are real, the God that worked in them and through them and for them um, is the same one that we have now. And indeed, their battles and their challenges are not altogether different from the ones we face. Yes, the situations differ. Okay, the, the circumstances in those times, the culture, all differ. But the real thing is, they faced battles, we face battles. God came through for them, God will always come through for us. Okay, there are many stories in that Bible that we can learn from. And we decided to pick on different characters, okay, to share on. Of course, we won't exhaust all of it, okay. Uh, we just picked just a few as people uh, requested for. So, so far, we have taught on the story of Joseph, okay? And last week, we talked about Bathsheba, okay? The exciting thing about Bathsheba is um, you don't see much about her in the Bible, although um, her results are right there for us to see. And it was quite beautiful, okay? Studying about her, getting into some details. Even I had fun while preparing for the message. 
right? And I, I think it's, it's a beautiful one. You want to go back to watch that on our YouTube channel after this uh, service. All right, so today we are talking about another character. Okay, again, I find this exciting. Uh, mainly because it's not the very famous ones, um, although it was quite significant, especially in the Old Testament. In fact, um, he had a bearing on the New Testament as well. Okay, but what excites me about the fact that, yes, he wasn't uh, the most famous is that people watching can understand that the fact that you're not on the pages of the papers and you don't have a million followers on social media does not mean that God cannot do a good work in you, does not mean that God is not doing a good work in you, does not mean that God is not using you in mighty ways, okay? That's the exciting thing for me in looking at this man's story. And who are we talking about today? Aaron. And that's the title of the sermon, Aaron. Okay, I'll read from Exodus chapter 4, verse 10 to 16, from the New King James Version of the Bible. Exodus chapter 4, verse 10 to 16. Then Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth, or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seen or the blind have not I the Lord? Now, therefore, go and I'll be with your mouth and teach you what to say. But he said, O oh my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. And look, he is also coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he'll be glad in his heart. Now, you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you what you shall do. Verse 16. So he shall be your spokesman to the people, and he himself shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God. Great. Okay, so um, you probably found it interesting that I said, we want to talk about Aaron. And then when I opened the Bible verse, it was Moses having a conversation with God, right? Yes, uh, just like last week when we were teaching on Bathsheba and the story we read from was David having fun on his balcony, okay, and doing point and kill, right? Yes, um, because just like Bathsheba, um, Aaron's story cannot be told without Moses as the main character, just like Bathsheba's story could not have been told without David as the main character, okay? Um, you, you, you may want to just take a moment to, to think about Aaron's life, okay? His life must have been very interesting, very, very interesting, especially from the moment his brother was born, right? Yes. See, he was not within the range of young boys marked for death. So this was, this was the, the, the circumstances that surrounded uh, Moses' birth. The Israelites in Egypt were growing, at a very scary rate for the Egyptians, okay? And so the Pharaoh decided that every male child born to any Israelite family must be killed at birth. And so he spoke to the midwives, the Jewish midwives, and told them what to do. Of course, these midwives did not do it and lied to him that, well, before they got there, the Hebrew women had put to bed which is where you probably hear people say, oh, you put to bed like the Hebrew women, all right? And so Pharaoh decided, no problem. I will get my guys out. I will be killing every baby born. And then Moses was born at about that time, and his mother had to hide him somewhere. And then after a while, she put him out in the river where she knew that Pharaoh's daughter would see him. And so Pharaoh's daughter picked up Moses, okay? Moses' mother then became his nurse. And so that was it. Moses had to grow up in the palace, okay, as a prince. And if you spare a thought for Aaron in all of this, of course, he wasn't um, being born at that time, okay? So he was a toddler already and all that. So he had escaped all of that. But 
So he was going to lose his younger brother when his younger brother was born. He was either going to lose him to death, well, he was going to lose him to death. But in this case, he lost him to royalty instead. He didn't lose him to death, he lost him to royalty. And in this case, it's probably even worse. Because now Moses had been adopted as Pharaoh's daughter and was growing up as a prince while Aaron was growing up as a slave. Their realities were very much different. Moses probably had all the toys he wanted. Living in a palace, he was being served while his brother was the one serving. He was giving instructions while his brother was being instructed. He was eating whatever he wanted while his brother was feeding from hand to mouth. And you know what it feels like for you to be at your level, you're not even a slave, but at your level, and to say, well, my immediate younger brother lives in the White House or lives in Buckingham Palace. My immediate younger brother. At your own level, and you're not even a slave. But now we talk about a slave. And the guy that was born after him was a big boy. And so you can imagine what it felt like for Aaron to see Moses pass by with his entourage while he was molding blocks. You, you can imagine how it felt. Okay? You can imagine what it felt like to see his brother and not be able to approach him. Because it would have made all the difference, right? For me to see my younger brother who lives in the palace passing by and I'm able to take a selfie. You know, and, and that's all I'm going to ask of him. A selfie a week. And that's all the content I'm putting out on Instagram. And before you know it, I'm an influencer, right? <laughs> because I have links. But he, he couldn't even get close to him. And that was his baby brother. Okay, and so you can imagine what it felt like. Maybe to even make matters worse. This was a secret he knew. A secret that most people probably didn't know. And he was not permitted to tell. So he couldn't go around and say, do, do, do you know Moses? That guy called Moses? In the palace? He's my younger brother. I swear. I, I, I swear. I can, I can call my mother. I can call my sister. He, he couldn't even say it. He couldn't. He couldn't go up to Moses and say, brother, baby brother, can't you adopt us into the palace? Can't you bring us in there? And the Bible tells us about Moses living as a prince for 40 years before he got into trouble. And so it means that this was Aaron's reality for all of those 40 years. Sometimes it's easy to accept that life is not going well for you. But it gets a lot more difficult when you see somebody that is a part of you who has it exactly the opposite way. Sometimes you don't know you're suffering until someone shows up that is not. Okay, that then amplifies your problems. And Aaron had to live like this for 40 years. And then, at 40, his brother Moses disappeared because he had committed a crime. He had a passion for his people. And when he saw somebody, an Egyptian, beating an Israelite, he struck the Egyptian and killed him. And then, eventually found out that it wasn't a secret after all. And so he ran. Because now, he understood that Pharaoh was out to get him. I guess at that time, the secret came out. So he ran. Okay, and Aaron's life must have been a bit simpler from then. Oh, well, he didn't stop being a slave. He didn't stop molding bricks. But at least he didn't have to look at his brother in the palace and feel, hmm, I wish that was me. He didn't have to look at his brother and say, hey, why, why isn't he helping? At this point now, he looks like the brother was dead. Okay, and, and I guess he accepted his lot. Except that 40 years again after, Moses shows up. And this brother did not just show up this time. Now, Aaron must serve him. You should spare a thought for Aaron, right? Because it must have been extremely difficult for him, for any brother to bear, actually, okay? But not for Aaron, who had served 
I lived as a slave for 83 years. And so I guess for him, it must have been like, well, if I could be serving people I hated all my life, then it would not hurt to serve my brother on our way to freedom. Okay? And so it looks like all of Aaron's existence was about Moses. As a matter of fact, Aaron's name was not even mentioned in the Bible till God was about to send Moses back to Egypt. Exodus 4 verse 14. When Moses was saying, you know what? I, I can't speak well. Lord, send somebody else. That was when God mentioned Aaron's name for the first time. And I don't know if you have ever felt like you're living in someone's shadow. Well, you're not the first. And I, I guess as long as the shadow is a good one, you should be fine. But Aaron was living totally under his brother's shadow. And of course, as we know the story, Aaron thereafter became the first priest in Israel, okay? Um, because that was the assignment God gave him, you know, in the new nation of Israel that was going to be formed. But sometimes I wonder if he would have preferred his life before Moses' return. Okay, because now he has taken on the role of assistant to his brother, um, but found himself in a leadership role that he was hardly prepared for. He had lived all his life as a slave. He spent more than 80 years taking instructions. And now he has to switch positions, you know, and, and, and you probably see it in Exodus chapter 32 when, when, Moses was on the mountain talking to God. The, 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 the Israelites then came to Aaron and said, you know what, you need to make us an idol that will lead us out of this place. So as for this Moses, we don't know what has become of him. So you need to make us an idol. Okay. And Aaron immediately asked them, okay, so bring, bring, your, bring your jewelries, bring everything you have, let's, let's do this. He just shows all his life he had been taking instructions. He wasn't ever the one that was going to be given the instructions. And so he did that. It was funny because when Moses came down and asked him, why have you done this? <laughs> Aaron, Aaron did what someone that had been a slave for a long time would do. He said, it's the people. The people, they came to me and they said, make us a God to lead us out of Israel. He said, I took all the jewelries and threw it in the fire and this calf just came out. <laughs> <laughs> nice story. Calf just came out by itself with the full design. But again, yes, that's what a slave would do. Not take responsibility. They never had to take responsibility for anything. A slave would not write a to-do list. A slave would not set goals. New Year resolutions, nothing like that. Because a slave did not own himself. Someone owned him. And that was a life Aaron had to live for all of those years. And then, a few chapters down, Leviticus chapter 10, you see another tragedy befalling him. His children, Nadab and Abihu, who obviously also had not tested privilege before, were now going to be children of the priests and have access to the tabernacle, have access to the holies of all. And again, they misused it and went and lit a fire when they were not supposed to. And so God struck them. And you wonder what a life. But a friend wanted us to talk about Aaron. I sent this in. I said he wanted to know what it must have felt like to serve his brother. And this is what it must have felt like. Difficult. Difficult because my brother always had it good and I didn't. But then he also realized that serving with this person would get him out of the pain he's always known because what you have always known is not necessarily what you are destined for. And so even if he felt any bit of pain at what life had dealt him, serving his brother was about the best thing he could do. But what are the other things we learned from Aaron? Just two or three points I'll make here. And it's a wrap. The first one, and I'd like you to write this in your note. It's a prayer I say a lot. And it's a prayer I think you should say from now. Okay? But this is the first point. God can prepare a place for you. But it's good to also prepare for the place. And this is the way I say that prayer. 
when you prepare something for me, prepare me for it. Okay? And I was talking about Aaron um, and all his years in slavery. And so it's understandable that God chose Moses to bring his people out of slavery. After all, he grew up with a palace mindset and did not have any of the self-esteem issues that would plague a slave. He didn't grow up a slave. And so he knew what it felt like to give instructions. He knew what it felt like to take responsibility. He knew what it felt like to hold his head up high. Aaron did not. He didn't know any of this. Moses would have understood power, would have understood negotiation. And as you would read throughout his story, he was always negotiating with God. All the times God would say, Moses, step back. I want to destroy these people. Moses would then stand up and say, destroy them? Do you want to destroy them? Do you know what the Egyptians will say? Do you know what the Assyrians will say? They'll say it's because you can't take care of them. That's why I've taken them to the wilderness and killed them there. Don't do it. It's not the best. Not once, not twice, not three. In fact, God said to Moses, you know what? Let's end them. I'll start a new generation from you. Moses said, no, we can't do that. He stood up, negotiated. Aaron could negotiate with the people. Moses could negotiate with God. Why? Because their upbringings were different. He grew up in the palace. He grew up fearless. But Aaron did not. He didn't have all of this. And so he definitely would have to go through a lot of mental shift to catch up. And this I'm not sure he was able to do. After all, it was 83 years. 83 long years. Many people die before 83 and you still say maybe they lived a long life. 83 years. Must have been difficult. Okay, so I'm not sure he was able to learn it. But it's in the Bible for us, we can see it. Or sometimes the things you have been used to will stop you from the things that are to come. And I've always said that prayer. And I'd like you to say it as often as possible. Lord, I should prepare a place for me. Prepare me for the place. In fact, there's another way I say that prayer. Which is also applicable in their own story. And it is, Lord, when you take me out of something, take that thing out of me. You take me out of slavery, take slavery out of me. You take me out of poverty, take poverty out of me. That's why you can be very wealthy and still be greedy. Very wealthy and extremely selfish. Why? Because hunger has left your tummy and gone to your mind. And at that point, money cannot take care of it anymore. And you've probably seen them. Rich people, but extremely greedy. That's the problem. They've been taken out of poverty. Poverty hasn't left them. And it's a prayer you want to say. And beyond saying the prayer, it takes a whole lot of soul check. Why am I thinking the way I think? Why am I talking the way I talk? Why do I have these fears that I have? Why have I believed these things I believe? It's critical because you can speak in tongues very much. You can pray a lot. But your mind is a container into which God will drop stuff. And if it is filled with mess, filled with fear, filled with greed, filled with residue of where God has taken you from, then it's going to contaminate whatever is given to you now. And so, Lord, when you take me out of something, take it out of me. Next point. Because the first one wasn't very good on Aaron, but the second one is amazing on him. Second lesson, always keep a good heart. Always keep a good heart. See, so we've described the difference between Aaron's growing up and that of Moses. Aaron had the bad deal all the way. Moses, the good one. And so it's safe to say that if Aaron was anything at all, like Joseph's brothers, then there was no way he could have served Moses. After all, Joseph only had dreams. He dreamt and got a coat. That was it. Moses, in this case, was living the life for 40 good years. 
And Aaron was seen, so this wasn't a dream. And you're talking about coat of many colors? Moses obviously would have had plenty. If Aaron was anything like Joseph's brothers, he wouldn't have served him. But interesting, God introduces Aaron to Moses again after so many years. In Exodus 4.14, the very first time we see Aaron's name mentioned in the Bible. And God was saying to Moses, is Aaron not your brother? I know he speaks well. He in fact, he's on his way to you and he has gladness in his heart. He's happy to see you. That's what God said. So apparently, God knew Moses was going to come up with his complaint, was going to flaunt his handicap in God's face. You know there are times we're happy about our handicap. At times we're really happy about it. And God says, I need somebody to give this amount somewhere. He said, thank God I don't have that much. You can't be me talking about. When? God says, I need somebody to be responsible for this. And he said, thank God it's not me. I, I, I don't have a decision to make there. For instance, I can't have a problem being in a church and they say, oh, I need someone to drop $10 million now, $10 million. I, 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 I don't have to check my heart for it. It's, it's not in the account, so there's nothing to check my heart for. Okay, sometimes your handicap can save you, <laughs> right? And so for Moses, it came in handy at that time. God, I cannot speak. <laughs> I can't speak. Don't worry. I can't. God, however, knew that was going to come. He knew it. Before I even got into the conversation with Moses, he had brought Aaron on the way. But why did he bring Aaron? Because Aaron obviously wasn't the only person that could speak well. Why Aaron? It's in there. God said, he's happy to see you. He's excited to see you. He saw you living the life while he was suffering. But what's in his heart is not beef. He knows you more than all the other people. Knows your secret. But he still loves you. And is willing to serve you. Because his heart was good. And so the Bible says that he saw Moses and hugged him and kissed him and wept and was happy. In fact, it was so much that David wrote about it in Psalm 133, where he said, Behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. He said it's like the oil that flows from Aaron's beard and all over his body. Keep a good heart. I'm drawing similarities with the story of Joseph, because again, in this kind of situation, it wasn't the fault of Moses that he had to grow in the palace. But of course... There are many times people can beef you for what is not your fault. That happens a lot. In the same way, we can praise you for what is not your doing. And you just have to be humble to admit that it's God working. But Aaron then sees Moses. And hears again that not only has my younger brother been enjoying while I was suffering, now that I'm seeing my younger brother again, I am supposed to serve him. In fact, God said to Moses, you will be as a God to him. And in spite of all of this, Aaron sees Moses and is excited and is happy. And God saw that and called him and then went to Moses to call him. So he had called Aaron before calling Moses. I said to Moses, I chose your brother because he loves you. Sometimes your greatness is tied to somebody else's. But bitterness keeps you away from them just because they started to shine before you. And then you get bitter, you get angry. But that's not the way it works. Sometimes you have to be a number two to somebody. And we shared that some weeks ago. Only God knows how many number two and number three people are greater than many number firsts or number ones. You never know. And so Aaron was happy. And you might need to note this. Being happy for someone else is a superpower. I'm telling you, not many people have it. But it is a superpower. Because then God would feel safe to put his great people 
within your reach because he knows they'll be safe. He knows they'll be loved. It's a superpower. Being happy for people. Someone said, be happy when God blesses your neighbor because it means he's in your neighborhood. Be happy. Keep a good heart. Take envy away. Take jealousy away. Those things don't keep your adversary down. They keep you down. They keep your eyes on somebody doing well and take your eyes away from the things that are working for you. That's what envy does. You know the story of Saul and David. Saul, the king, was so envious of David that they left palace to be looking for him in the jungle and the old king became somebody that would be squatting in the bush to poop just because he was trying to catch a young boy. That's what envy does. But Aaron didn't have that. I was coming to see his brother. Even after hearing that he's still going to serve that brother. And that his existence will pretty much be dependent on his brother. He still had a lot of joy seeing him. What's in your heart? Really? Because you've got to be careful. When God wants to bless you, he's going to use people. And if you don't have love for people, then you are missing out on blessings. I've never seen someone so spiritual that they prayed for money and money rained from heaven. No. I've never seen someone so spiritual that they prayed for a job and God opened a company and brought them in. No. You will always have to work with people. And if your heart is good, then God will bring his chosen people, his great people near you because he knows no evil or harm will come on them. And lastly, which is very close to the second one, serve. That's the last instruction, the last lesson we learn here from Aaron. Serve. Aaron was in far away Goshen in the land of Egypt. Moses was a Midian. God knew that Moses was going to come up with a complaint. He sorted the solution miles away. And he didn't say, Moses, you go into Egypt and look for him. He said, no, I'm bringing him here. And he's going to serve you. Sometimes we have issues with that word. We hate it when we are called to serve. We sometimes think that it means we are not great and it means that we are, we, are, we are inferior to whoever it is that we are serving. But I remember many years ago, uh, we used to preach in our undergraduate days around and we tell people that service is the rent you pay for the, the space you occupy on us. Service is the rent you pay for the space you occupy on us. And there's a question you want to ask yourself. What am I making happen for someone? Whose life is getting better because of me? Can God tell somebody that this prayer you have said, Tola is coming to answer it. Many times it's easy for us to pray, Lord, send somebody to me. But when have you prayed, Lord, send me to somebody? You know what we say, that for some people, their motto is get all you can, can all you get, and sit on the can. But life is more than that. They say it's not about duration, it's about donation. Who are you serving? Whose face are you putting a smile on? And so you write your daily goals, you write your weekly goals, your monthly goals, your yearly goals. But does giving occur there? Does helping anyone occur there? And in this world where we are privileged to even have social media, which means there are no walls, right? You see people, many people that you can serve. Many people that you can bless. And so Aaron was spotted because he had that heart. And God brought him to Moses. I probably would have complained. Am I, am I going to serve this guy again? 
God, you, you created both of us. You should know he's younger than me. You should know. He lived in the palace. I was living. It was me and this other guy that built this building. You are seeing God. You, you know we can lecture God, right? And I, you, you know it. He's, he's lived the life. And now he's back. And I'm still supposed to serve him. But they all understood that if his life was going to have any meaning, it would be through serving Moses. And so he became the first priest. And his descendants became the priestly descendants. Serve. And this might be something, the only thing somebody needs to hear. Your service is a seed. It's something you plant somewhere that grows up. It grows. Galatians 6, 9. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he reaps. It is critical to serve. Sometimes you are trusting God for a blessing and it's hidden in that place of service. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 14, the Bible talked about when Jesus visited the house of Peter and Peter's mother-in-law was sick with a fever. And the Bible says, and Jesus healed her and then she rose up and made food for him. And a friend once said that maybe there are some people that should feed you, but they are sick. They have the food. You have the healing. You refuse to drop healing. No food for you. Eat your healing. Life is all about exchange. Money that you hold is a means of exchange. Service is another means of exchange. You give your money to somebody. You get what they have. You give your service to somebody. You get what they have. And not just what they have, but what God has. Service is critical. And it's a big lesson we can learn from the story of Aaron, and I hope you learn it. God is calling you to serve. And the same God says a laborer is worthy of his wages. And I say to you, as you make up your mind to serve people and to keep a good heart, God is watching. He's arranging the rest of your life. He's arranging those promotions. He's arranging those blessings. He's arranging all of those. And all he needs is for you to put yourself in that position of service to make things happen for other people. Because as you're doing it, you're learning skills. You're getting better at what you do. And you're learning humility. Because pride and service don't go hand in hand. And God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Many advantages in service. And I trust that as you make up your mind to act on what we are learning today, that God will make your path clear before you in the name of Jesus. Like we established, God must have spoken to Aaron before he went to speak to Moses. And I declare concerning you, your ears will hear God's voice. You will be on time in the name of Jesus. Some people are able to say what God said to them five years ago, 10 years ago, 50 years ago, but not able to say what God is saying now. You will be able to say that because God will find your heart right. He will find you in the place of service. His voice will be made known to you in the name of Jesus. When we talk about service, it includes praying for people, holding people's hands, comforting people. And in the name of Jesus, God will open your eyes to your place of service. He will open your eyes to the people you should help. And he himself will not leave you nor forsake you. From today, I declare your life will have meaning. I declare that your life will bring joy to many. I pray that the Lord will open your eyes to your place of service. I pray that from now, God will make plain to you your path. Show you where to serve, who to serve. Show you where to be a blessing in the name of Jesus. Somebody is wondering, what, what really is the essence of life? Is it just to go to work and wages on a monthly basis? God will give your life a meaning in the name of Jesus. You will go to bed every night with a smile on your face. You will wake up the following morning energized to make contributions to mankind. In the name of Jesus, I declare, someone listening to me is free from depression. He's free from that feeling of uselessness. In the name of Jesus, there's a reason God has sent you here and will show it to you in this season. I pray for someone right here now who is up against a huge project. 
You are running out of contact, running out of funds, running out of resources. And God would have me tell you that you have nothing to worry about. He says, better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And he says, it will surprise you in the name of Jesus. At this time, I want to pray for somebody under the sound of my voice that says, well, I don't have a relationship with God. Because yes, these things we have shared um, require a decision. But beyond that, requires God's grace to bring them to pass. And I want to pray for you if you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Again, we've said for God knows how long. Jesus is coming soon. It is sounding cliche now. But hey, it's still true. Every day brings it closer. And the scary part, he didn't tell us when he'll come. And so he can come at any time. Why not prepare? Why not be ready? You want to give your life to Jesus? Just put your hand on your chest and say after me, Lord Jesus, I thank you for this opportunity. I confess my sins. And I ask you to forgive me. Accept me as your child. Make me yours forever. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for everyone saying yes to you at this time. Your word says, whoever comes to you, you will not cast away. We ask, Lord, that you help us once to find joy in you. Help them to become more and more like you. Help them to be all that you have made them to be. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. If you said that prayer, I say big congratulations to you. It's the best decision you can ever make. All right. Well, now that you're on this path, uh, we are all growing. Okay, we are all growing in God, growing in grace. And so I would like to encourage you uh, to please team up with us as we all grow on this journey. Send us an email, hello at peacechurchglobal.org or pastor at peacechurchglobal.org so that we can share with you resources that will help you as we grow together in God's grace and in his knowledge. All right, thank you very much uh, for making that call. At this time, we'd like to give to God. Um, again, like we said, life is not about duration it is about donation it's about what you are giving okay and at this time uh, we would like to give to god um, in this service if you are watching from canada then you can give to uh give at peacechurchglobal.org that's our interact transfer details if you're watching from outside canada then you can give using paypal or using stripe uh, it just requires you to put your card information and the amount you want to give it will do the conversion and whatever charges there are will be built to us and not to you thank you very much for giving uh, we trust god uh, that says as long as the earth remains seed time and harvest will not cease we trust god that your harvest will be sure in Jesus name all right um, so right now we are counting down to uh, where we'll start in person service we've been announcing this if you feel um, led to serve with us in any way uh, even if you are not located in Calgary there might be a way you can help out somewhere uh, just reach out to us okay um, send us an email send us a DM on social media and we will reach you and discuss how you can uh, be of service to us all right um, Yes, that's it. Uh, I should also invite you to our um, Bible study that happens 8 p.m. Mountain Time every Wednesday. Lives are changing, I assure you, and you want to be a part of this. Put it down in your calendar um, and then sign up on our website so that we can reach out to you. And lastly, we have our Teens Church that is going to start uh, on a big note when Physical Church starts. Again, all of these services will be online as well. So if you have any teenager that wants to be a part of this, you do know it's a passion I have. Uh, please send us their details. We'll reach out to them. And in no time, they'll be like a part of the family. All right. Okay, so that's all there is from me today. Please don't forget the lessons you've learned and invite other people to watch these videos on YouTube. They will thank you for it. At this time, I hand you over to our amazing kids uh, at PCG Juniors. See you next week. God bless you. Thank you.